everyone. My name is Jacinth A. Galpin, and I am the creator, author, and producer of the Risk Tree podcast. I am so glad to be with you here at Risk Awareness Week. In my session today, I will be talking about Napoleon Bonaparte and risk based decision making. If any of you are familiar with the Risk Tree podcast, you will know that Napoleon Bonaparte is by far my favorite historical figure of all time. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Napoleon's trajectory when it comes to risk management traverses from being quite possibly the greatest risk manager of all time to being quite possibly the worst risk manager of all time. Napoleon, in so many ways, is the perfect encapsulation in a single lifetime of what to do and what not to do when it comes to risk. What I want to take you through today is Napoleon's risk timeline, from the time he was an exceptional risk manager to the time he wasn't so good at managing risk. And to use Napoleon's trajectory to illustrate what good risk decision making looks like versus what bad risk decision making looks like. This session might be a little different to the other sessions here at Risk Awareness Week in that it is very history driven, but the lessons learned from Napoleon when it comes to decision making are absolutely applicable in our modern day practice of risk management as a discipline. I hope you enjoy. France in 1795 continued to be a country in flux. It had been six years since the start of the French Revolution and two years since the execution of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. The French remained at war with much of Europe, engaging in costly battles almost constantly. The French economy remained the sick man of Europe, crippled by hyperinflation. And the reign of terror saw thousands executed, many without due process. This was a time of genuine mayhem, where, fortune, where fortunes could dissipate as quickly as they materialised. It is within this mayhem that Napoleon Bonaparte, a 25-year-old general at the time, seized opportunity. Napoleon recognised that mayhem created power vacuums, vacuums he was only too happy to exploit and fill. During a royalist insurrection in October 1795, he quickly dispersed the rebellion, becoming a hero to those hungry for revolution. Many saw Napoleon's actions as a courageous defending of revolutionary principle and proof that Napoleon supported the revolution. The reality was a little more complex. There is evidence to suggest that Napoleon was indeed committed to what he saw as the end of a tyrannical monarchy. But there is also evidence to suggest that Napoleon's suppression of the insurrection and his alliance to the revolution, it was one where he held his nose and did what he needed to do in order to gain power. Napoleon didn't necessarily enjoy the bloodshed, the lack of due process, the instability. But if playing in that space gave him what he wanted, and what Napoleon wanted was power, privilege, and money. Let's not get it twisted, Napoleon wasn't Gandhi. Well, it was a means to an end. What we see in the 1795 insurrection is Napoleon expertly reading his context and understanding his environment. Understanding both opportunity and threat. The opportunity to be on the winning side, the threat of losing, which would result in him losing the support of royalists and revolutionaries alike. Napoleon intimately understood both options. Planning out a risk-based strategy that gave him the greatest chance of success and executing his strategy with discipline and precision. In 1796, Napoleon married Josephine de Bohane the widow of Alexander de Bohane, who had been executed by revolutionaries in 1794 as a traitor to the revolution. There is no question that Napoleon loved Josephine deeply, but their marriage was not held together by love alone. 
Despite Alexander's execution, Josephine was both wealthy and well-connected with the revolution. Napoleon knew that Josephine's money and connections would work to his advantage. Through his marriage to Josephine, we see Napoleon building on bench strength through lines of defence. Now, I know that in 2019, lines of defence is controversial, largely because its application in corporations over the last 10 years has been pretty darn awful. But when it comes to threat dilution, lines of defence as a principle, it still works. Marriage to Josephine gave Napoleon both additional street cred when it came to the revolution and it offered him money, which provided him privilege in an economically crippled France and which insulated him against the worst excesses of the revolution. Throughout this early part of his career, we see Napoleon being a grade A opportunist, playing a multi-dimensional game of chess leveraging existing power structures and making sure he was in the right place at the right time. Being an opportunist worked for Napoleon. Within a few years, he'd gone from a nobody to a wealthy, privileged and well-connected general. There's an argument to suggest that Napoleon probably could have continued to successfully play the role of opportunist infinitum. But Napoleon, he wasn't built for the status quo. He was a man who sought perpetual motion and momentum. In 1796, Napoleon was commissioned to lead the first Italian campaign. The first Italian campaign, which had started in 1792, was a series of battles between revolutionary France and a coalition consisting of Austria, Russia and Piedmont Sardinia, which is now modern day Italy. Napoleon was determined to turn around a campaign that had, to date, not worked in the French's favour. But there was a problem. His army was hopelessly outnumbered, and his army wasn't the practised fighting machine of his opponents. Napoleon recognised that if he abided by traditional military strategy and logic, he would lose. If he wanted to win, he would have to think differently. He would have to disrupt. And that's what Napoleon, and that's precisely what Napoleon did in successive battles during the Italian campaign in 1796 and 1797. He dumped traditional military strategy, opting for guerrilla-esque maneuvers. He took his time to educate and train his men on the strategy. When they doubted, and remember, Napoleon was pretty much throwing out the rule book when it came to military strategy. So they were likely thinking, what the hell? He would physically lead from the front and role model the behaviours he wanted them to master. From Donald Horwood from Florida State University. He goes up in the mountains. He spreads his forces out. The enemy doesn't know where he is, so they begin to spread their forces out. Then at the last minute, he quickly concentrates his forces. He achieves mass superiority and then he blasts them. It's lightning. Napoleon's armies could go up to 30 miles a day. The enemy were rolling along at about six or seven miles a day. From Owen Connolly at the University of South Carolina, Napoleon said there's nothing theoretical about war. You do what you have to do. You do it fast and you surprise the enemy and shock him if you can. Move quickly and be ruthless about it. Napoleon triumphed in the Italian campaign, returning to Paris as a hero, a man who had triumphed against the odds for the eternal glory of France. His victory served as vindication of the revolution and it cemented Napoleon as one of the most powerful men in France. What Napoleon did in the Italian campaign was incredibly risky acting against centuries of proven and meticulously curated military strategy, when the French were already on the defence and on the verge of losing the entire war. That's brass balls right there. But Napoleon acted the way he did because he had no other option but to roll the most risky dice of all, the dice of disruption. Napoleon could either maintain the status quo and absolutely lose, or he could disrupt 
and potentially win. What we see in the Italian campaign is Napoleon recognising his environmental context and redefining his environment in order to stack the deck in his favour, innovating his approach and his strategy in order to guarantee himself and France victory. What we also see in the Italian campaign is the importance of leadership when it comes to risk, the benefit of taking your people on the risk journey, setting the tone, the expectations, the appetite and leading from the front. Napoleon repeated his disruptive trajectory in the 1788 Egyptian campaign. At the time, France was still at war with Great Britain with no end in sight. Napoleon hypothesised that if he could disrupt Great Britain's trade routes to India and the Far East, routes that utilised Egypt as a conduit, he could disrupt Great Britain's supply chain and force a defeat built out of attrition. At the time, traditional military wisdom argued that European armies were destined for defeat in Africa. For Napoleon, he had learned via the Italian campaign that traditional military wisdom, it was only useful when it was useful. At the Battle of the Pyramids in July 1798, Napoleon was able to secure victory in less than one hour using an innovative square formation. He set up his troops in five massive rectangles and ordered his men to only shoot at their enemies when they were within 30 yards of the formations. The 30-yard command was done for a very clever reason. One, 30 yards was the perfect distance for Napoleon's men to accurately dispatch the enemy using their guns and cannons, men and horses alike. At 30 yards, the enemy would fall where they were shot, creating a wall of bodies around the French formations that made further intrusions by the enemy near impossible. This was diabolical, if somewhat gruesome genius. Napoleon used his enemies dead to create a wall of protection around his own soldiers, a wall that shielded his men from further attacks, all the while allowing them to continue their offence. In the, in the Egyptian campaign, as we saw in the Italian campaign, we see Napoleon challenging traditional doctrine when faced with an unwinnable situation. This is a super important lesson in risk-based decision-making because sometimes we are going to encounter situations that seem unwinnable. We are going to encounter a circumstance or problem or challenge that on the face of it ends with us losing. Napoleon's example shows us that challenging traditional doctrine establishes an alternative competitive space that exists on our terms. Napoleon made his first big mistake in Egypt, barely a month after the glorious Battle of the Pyramids. In August of 1798, the magnificent British Admiral Horatio Nelson captured the entirety of Napoleon's warships, which were anchored off the coast in Aboukir Bay, around 20 miles northeast of um, Alexandria. And in an epic battle that came to be known as the Battle of the Nile, Nelson blew them up, stranding Napoleon in Egypt with no route home to France and no supplies. The Battle of the Nile should have been a sage lesson learned for Napoleon. It wasn't that the French had necessarily done anything wrong. They had established a robust defence position. They were ready to fight and they fought gallantly despite poor odds. But they had lost. And when you lose, you need to find out why so that you can prevent a recurrence in the future. Napoleon's response to the Battle of the Nile, he set himself up in a palace in Cairo, fantasizing for weeks and months of the glorious day he would officially be the 18th century equivalent of Alexander the Great. There would be no post-mortem to identify what had gone wrong, nor did Napoleon put in any new controls or treatment strategies to prevent a recurrence. We see post the Battle of the Nile that Napoleon had stopped trying to learn from the past as a way of directing the future. It was perhaps the first clear indication that Napoleon was losing his risk edge.
It wasn't until February 1799 that Napoleon finally made a move from his sojourn in Cairo, manoeuvring his troops into Syria. It was not to be a happy campaign. His soldiers were sick, they were exhausted, and with the French losing more battles than they won, they were utterly demoralised. In August 1799, Napoleon abandoned his troops and returned to France. He did not return to France because he was seeking reinforcements that he would then use to return to Syria and secure his soldiers' return. No, he returned to France because he learned that power vacuums had reopened in France and he wanted to personally capitalise on those vacuums. I feel somewhat conflicted about Napoleon's return to France. I mean, on one hand, it's classic Napoleon-esque opportunism. Play it where it lays, play to win, chase opportunity and grab the furniture. You can't help but admire the man's single-mindedness and commitment to the cause. But Napoleon totally failed the leadership test when it came to the decision to depart Syria. The Napoleon of the first Italian campaign would have never abandoned his own men. He would have stayed and strategized a solution, whether that was to remain and fight or to exit graciously. The Napoleon of 1799 prioritized personal gain over leadership, his integrity, and perhaps most importantly, the trust his men had invested in him, which he then so carelessly discarded. Napoleon returned to France and did what Napoleon always did. He capitalised. He led a second Italian campaign starting in 1799, which was successful, and he signed a temporary peace treaty with Great Britain. For the first time in over a decade, Europe was at peace. In 1802, Napoleon was declared, by virtue of a newly introduced French constitution, first consul for life, giving him unprecedented power, which Napoleon, in classic Napoleonic fashion, totally exploited. Over the next two years, he restructured the French education system. He stabilised trade. He increased wages. And he introduced the Napoleonic Code, which simplified the ridiculously overcomplex French legal system, and which today, in 2019, still forms the basis of civil law provisions in France. The French were thrilled that for the first time in New the French were thrilled that for the first time in nearly two decades, the country was not at war with anyone, and that they could now lead normal lives. In 1804, at the age of just 35, with France both at peace and prosperous, Napoleon was crowned Emperor of France. In just under a decade, he had achieved what he had always coveted, power, wealth, adoration, a place in history. It was at this moment, the precise moment where Napoleon had obtained everything he had ever wanted, and was very likely the most powerful man in France, that Napoleon came completely undone as a risk manager. Napoleon was a man who operated best when he was behind, when he was the underdog. Being an underdog meant he had less to lose and everything to gain. It meant he didn't have to play by traditional rules, which allowed him to make rules that suited and favoured him. Napoleon used risk management to maximise his position as an underdog, and he deployed risk management techniques to beat his heavier, stronger and more powerful opponents. His upward trajectory was a beautiful, real-time playing out of Napoleon as David and his enemy du jour, Goliath. Being an emperor with absolute power, completely shifted Napoleon's mindset away from that of the underdog, and that was not a good thing. He became complacent about threat. So if you accept that risk is at its core about the unknown and trying to manoeuvre ourselves away from the threat of the unknown while maximising the upside of the unknown, if you accept that definition, risk management becomes a balancing act between the positive and negative, right? <laughs> 
When Napoleon became emperor, he completely gave up on the balancing act, only chasing opportunity. It wasn't that he stopped seeing threat, he saw it. He was complacent about the impacts of threat because he figured he had the might and power by his position as emperor to simply crush threat. He figured that he was super smart and smart people can outwit threat. And he fervently believed that opportunity alone was enough to nullify threat. That is, if opportunity is good enough, threat becomes irrelevant. I mean, it's an approach, I guess, but we all know that risk management, it doesn't work like that. Napoleon's complacency, his hubris when it came to threat, a catastrophic fall from risk grace, it was all but inevitable. In 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia in an effort to stop, Ru in an effort to stop the Russians from trading with the British. The campaign, which lasted a few days shy of six months, was a hideous disaster from the outset. Napoleon had planned to conquer Russia in just under three weeks by forcing the Russians into a major battle. He envisaged that the Russians would be easily defeated. He would force them to cease trading with Great Britain and that everything would be okay in the Napoleonic world. The reality of the Russian campaign was vastly different to Napoleon's hopes and dreams. The Russians knew of Napoleon's intention to engage in a major battle, so they didn't engage. Instead, they retreated further and further east, scorching the earth as they went, which destroyed Napoleon's abilities to grab spoils of war and resources for his army, such as food and water. So while Napoleon was winning in terms of acquiring land, the land he had won was useless and barren. His armies slowly starved. Fights began to break out. Subordination and desertion became a daily occurrence. And Napoleon still hadn't achieved his aim of forcing the Russians to concede. This cat and mouse game went on for months, never changing, always repeating. By November, Napoleon found himself in a barren and destroyed Moscow, with a third of his army already dead from exhaustion, famine and disease. Still, the Russians refused to concede. Napoleon waited a month before retreating finally to Paris in humiliation. Over 500,000 French soldiers would die in the Russian campaign. The Russian campaign of 1812 was an aberration of risk from start to finish. Napoleon did not understand his context and his environment, underestimating what was needed in order to win. For example, when planning his supply chain for the Russian campaign, assuming it would be complete within three weeks, Napoleon resourced his war machine for 30 days. He did not have any redundancy or contingent plan in place should the campaign extend longer than 30 days. And when his big battle never materialised, he found himself caught without a reliable supply chain in place. When the campaign didn't go to plan and he didn't get that big battle he so hungered for, Napoleon didn't re-baseline the campaign and formulate new controls and treatment strategies. He just ploughed on, proving the long-held idiom that the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and somehow expect a different result. Napoleon ignored hard evidence that his controls and treatment strategies weren't working. For example, he was told by senior leaders that getting caught in the Russian winter, not a good idea. His senior leaders knew this and they told him that history told them that getting caught in the middle of Russia in the middle of winter, not a good idea. Napoleon chose to ignore evidence and effectively sentenced thousands of his loyal soldiers to an icy death in the Russian tundra. The Russian campaign solidified the notion that Napoleon had, by 1812, lost his capacity to effectively manage threat. He was no longer making decisions as he had in the past, weighing threat and opportunity carefully to determine an optimal solution. In April 1814, Napoleon was forced to abdicate his role as emperor, 
following a series of military losses in Europe. Europe was tired of Napoleon's predilection to pick fights with his neighbours. France was tired of Napoleon disrupting a long-held peace after years of revolution. They were tired of their sons marching to war and those sons not returning home. Napoleon grudgingly signed the Treaty of Fontainebleau on April 11, 1814, confirming his abdication, and he was subsequently exiled to Elba, located off the northeast coast of Italy. The unpopular Louis XVIII was installed as his replacement. Initially, Napoleon wallowed on Elba, spending his days dreaming of all he had lost. At one point, he attempted suicide. When he found out that his now ex-wife Josephine had passed away in Paris, he locked himself in his room, distraught, not eating and drinking for two days. But it wasn't long before the but it wasn't long before the old Napoleon, the underdog Napoleon, he came roaring back. In February 1815, recognizing that the French despised Louis XVIII and recognizing that popular sentiment in France might welcome his return. He landed in southern France and began to march towards Paris, gathering troops along the way. He arrived in Paris on March 20, 1815, to a rapturous welcome. Louis XVIII fled to Belgium, and Napoleon was, once again, the emperor. The French were happy, the rest of Europe not so much. We see in Napoleon's triumphant march into Paris a return to risk form. This was the Napoleon of old, understanding his context, planning his strategy, executing with precision. If only it could have stayed that way. Almost immediately after Napoleon returned to Paris, Great Britain, Prussia and Russia began to deploy troops to take Napoleon out once and for all. In June 1815, Napoleon fought in his last military engagement, the Battle of Waterloo. With the British and Prussians on one side and France on the other, the Battle of Waterloo would prove to be a horrible, ignominious end end for Napoleon as a dog of war. Napoleon tried deploying his usual tactics, but his enemies had now wised up to his tricks and had an answer for every manoeuvre he brought to the battlefield. Napoleon found himself at a loss and was soundly beaten. At the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon didn't countenance on his enemy being wise to his tricks. He made the mistake of not understanding his context, his environment and his opponents. His battle strategy was subsequently built on a faulty foundation. In addition, Napoleon had long ago stopped questioning the efficacy of his controls and treatment strategies. He had become predictable, presuming that tried and true methods would always work, even when it was clear they wouldn't. Napoleon had by also, Napoleon had by this time, also lost the ability to be agile, and he was unable to shift as his environment shifted. In Waterloo, Napoleon seemed unable to read his enemy and predict their trajectory. He became a sitting duck, making it easy for his enemy to run right over the top of him. Napoleon immediately returned to Paris after Waterloo and abdicated again, subsequently surrendering, subsequently surrendering himself to the British. This time there would be no triumphant return. There would be no return to risk form. Napoleon would live the rest of his life on the island of St. Helena, a prisoner of the British, alone aside from a retinue of guards and attendants. He would spend the rest of his life a broken man, passing away in May 1821 of what many believe to be stomach cancer. A lot of people ask me why I love Napoleon, given that for quite a reasonable portion of his career, he wasn't very good at managing risk. And the best explanation I can give for that is as risk, as risk practitioners, I feel we need risk heroes people who live our discipline and as a result provide real life examples of how risk management can be used. But those heroes, they don't need to be perfect. In fact, 
it's probably more interesting and more beneficial if they aren't, because that's reality, isn't it? The hero with a redemptive arc, the risk hero who makes mistakes but still recovers, the risk hero who might lose in the end but whose example offers us a sage lesson of what to do and what not to do. That's Napoleon for me. When he was at his peak, he was ferocious, relentless, built for the chase and ready for the win. At his lowest, he was complacent, driven by hubris and just asking, begging for someone to slap him upside the head and give him a healthy dose of a risk reality check. There is something in Napoleon's story for every one of us. Thanks everyone for attending this session today. I hope you enjoyed this session as much as I enjoyed pulling it together. I really could talk about Napoleon all day, which I imagine he himself would rather enjoy. If you want to get in contact with me post this session, I will leave my contact details here, or you can always catch me on LinkedIn. My thanks to my dear friend Alexei for the invitation to join you here on Risk Awareness Week. And my thanks to all the presenters at Risk Awareness Week for giving up their time to help our fantastic community of risk practitioners connect, mature, and figure out how we can push forward this most perfectly imperfect discipline. Have a great day, everyone. Uh -huh.